So I'm going to uh, give you a few minutes on the uh, wonderful world of uh, analytical methods for uh, viruses and gene therapy products, really focusing on how, um, how effective analysis requires both um, uh, what I guess nowadays we would call oldie worldy uh, virology methods and some not so oldie worldy virology methods um, and some that we've used for a long time um, to look at more traditional biologic products. Um, just before we get into that, just a, a couple of uh, slides just to introduce myself and, to, and Fujifilm Diacin. Um, so we're, um, we're a company of about 1,400 employees. Uh, we currently have three sites, uh, one in Billingham in the northeast of England, uh, one in uh, RTP in North Carolina, uh, and one in College Station, Texas. Um, we've worked on many, many different products. Uh, we're a traditional uh, biologics manufacturer, so we make protein therapeutics from microbial and mammalian systems um, and for the last few years we've um, branched out if you like into uh, viral products as well so our facility in College Station Texas uh, manufactures viral products um, those are infectious viruses and in particular gene therapy uh, viral vectors um, we currently manufacture eight licensed products across our, across our network um, and a few uh, months ago, it was announced that uh, we're expanding to add our fourth site, um, purchasing a facility from uh, Biogen in Denmark. Um, this is a large-scale cell culture facility, um, six by 20,000 litre stainless steel uh, bioreactor uh, facility for large volume MAB and other cell culture product production. Um, so that um, should, um, uh, the deal should all go through and be finalised um, around the uh, end of July, beginning of August. Um, the facility we use in Texas to manufacture um, um, the viral products, the gene therapy products, um, looks the kind of complete opposite to that facility that we're just uh, purchasing in uh, Denmark. Um, so as the, uh, as the panel were just describing in the previous session, um, it's all single use. So we're dealing with viral products, uh, products where there's a, a requirement to show containment and uh, ensure there's no carryover from one product to another. Um, so the only stainless steel that really exists in, uh, in our Texas facility um, is stainless steel that holds a bag of some sort. So uh, all the product contact equipment is uh, single use. Um, and actually um, in the photo here, this is a rather large uh, bioreactor for uh, us in Texas. Um, most of the work we do is, is at even smaller scale than this. Um, and it's done in the kind of clean rooms that you can see on the, on the right there. Um, so these are um, small, uh, mobile clean rooms, um, self-contained um, clean rooms where we can run each individual product. Um, in this facility that's photographed we have 14 of those and we have another facility with additional um, um, single-use clean rooms or mobile clean rooms. Um, so a high degree of segregation ensuring that um, there's no possibility of cross-contamination of products. All of these can be um, VHP sterilized um, in terms of the whole building can be VHP sterilized um, that's been used for the manufacture as well as single use flow paths and product contact equipment. So the complete opposite really of the, um, of the large 20,000 litre all stainless steel facility that we're, um, that we're in the process of purchasing in Denmark and that's traditionally used for large volume um, biologics. Um, and these are the guys that we're traditionally um, working with nowadays um, down in Texas. So um, various different sorts of viruses which are um, in, in development for uh, gene therapy applications. Um, mostly it's these three guys. Um, so as we've heard um, a lot about this morning, so lentiviruses, uh, particularly for um, ex vivo gene therapy, um, uh, CAR-T and other uh, transduction of those. Um, and then adenoviruses and, and AAV, adeno-associated viruses for in vivo gene therapy, where we're looking to deliver the gene to the, directly to the patient. Um, those, are, those are the things that we spend most of our time uh, playing with in Texas. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna go through a detail of all the specification uh, uh, challenges that are associated with these products, um, except to say that really they fall into two kind of categories, which I've tried to um, put on the two columns here. So there's a, there's a whole host of fairly standard safety and residual testing um, issues or specification uh, items that really are the same as for protein biologics. Um, it's got to be free of 
by a burden, we've got to get rid of endotoxin if there's any in there, we've got to make certain it's not uh, doesn't have any um, uh, virus that it's not supposed to have. Um, we have to deal with uh, replication competent virus, so uh, making sure that we can't infect anyone with the product, so that's a, a difference of course from, uh, from a biologic. Um, and process residuals, whether those are DNA or proteins or detergents or enzymes that we've added to the process, we have to show that those have been removed. So those are all fairly standard. Uh, we can borrow from our uh, biologics heritage as to how we deal with those. And then on the right hand side are more are things which are more um, relevant just because of the type of products that we're making. So how do we identify that we're delivering the right product um, and how do we determine the strength uh, which could be the, uh, the amount of particles we have, the number of particles that have been filled um, with nucleic acid, um, the amount of that nucleic acid which is actually the correct uh, product that it's supposed to be packaged and then of course a potency assay which in this case is you know can it be can it transduce cells and can we get expression of the gene of interest so a, a whole host of slightly different um, more biological assays than uh, we would typically see on a specification for a for a protein biologic um, and I've only got 10 minutes so I'm just picking a couple um, to talk to um, about how we would do that and how it, how we can rely to some extent depending on the products on some uh, virology and on others how we can rely on some of the methods we use for biologics. Okay, so let's talk about a fairly fundamental uh, specification item. How many viruses have I actually made? It's a fairly important property if you're about to have them injected into you. Um, so if we were, if this was a normal virus, um, the gold standard way of doing this is a plaque assay. So you basically uh, plate out, dilute your virus down and uh, plate it, if you like, onto uh, um, a permissive cell line, which will uh, allow it to replicate. And then you take a look under the microscope and if you're sufficiently skilled, much more skilled than I am, then you can spot the plaques and you can count them. That's the traditional way of doing it. Um, it's quite laborious, it takes a long time because you've got to wait for plaques to form um, and you require um, quite a lot of um, uh, secondary infection if you like. You know, the original foci of infection when you had one virus particle has to reinfect surrounding cells over and over again to give you a plaque that's big enough to actually see under the microscope. So it takes quite a long time and you run the possibility that actually some of those, um, some of those particles you produced actually escape if you like and form separate plaques and um, you overestimate the amount that's there but this is the, this is your gold standard method for you know for that virologists have used for decades on uh, counting how many particles they have um, now it's quite hard though doing that um, and it requires a replicating lytic virus in order to form a plaque um, so there are other way, other methods that we can add layer on top if you like um, to allow to make that job a little easier. So immunostaining is one of those. So we can add an antibody which um, detects the capsid uh, of the virus we're talking about. Um, and then we can use a, a colorimetric detection method. Um, and this has the advantage that it can deal with things that aren't lytic. So you can detect things even though they're not lysing the cells and forming plaques. And of course you can find them earlier because you've added extra sensitivity. So you don't have to wait for plaques to form. You don't have to wait for this kind of surrounding infection of other cells to happen. You can detect it after about 48 hours. And you can see actually, you know, just as if you were um, plating uh, bacteria, you know, if, you, if you're counting in, uh, in your picture that you take, you know, between 30 and a couple of hundred uh, um, um, spots, foci of infection, then actually you get pretty decent numbers. The stats work pretty well. Um, and you can see just three uh, replicates at the bottom there. And if, you get, and if you switch to fluorescence, you can, you can do it even better because actually now you can detect um, even earlier in the infection cycle. So rather than waiting 48 hours, we can now detect about 18 hours just because we get more amplification of those, of those signals. It's effectively the same process. We're now we're using the antibody to try to detect the cells which are producing capsid proteins um, before we see a, a, a plaque form. Um, if they're able to form a plaque or if they're not lytic, we would never see the plaque anyway. Um, we just have now uh, a a stronger signal, if you like, than the colorimetric uh, reagent um, that allows us to detect things even faster. So uh, exactly the same idea though, um, we look at fields of view under a fluorescent microscope, we count how many spots we see um, and that equates to um, how, many, uh, how, many how many infectious virus we have. But the fluorescence assay has the even, even better uh, application that you can automate it. So you can use this in a fax machine. Um, so you can actually um, look at um, um, 
very quickly you can get very good estimates of the number of infected cells because rather than screening just those kind of snapshot pictures where you're physically counting you can now shoot thousands and thousands of cells through the fax machine get much more robust numbers um, the other big advantage of the fax is that you can do this as for in process samples so we don't need purified material we don't need anything that's very nice you can shoot all kinds of stuff through the fax machine and get a real good idea of how many um, how much um, uh, infected particles we have um, so, so rather straightforward on the left hand side of the uninfected cells we, we get a little bit of uh, background fluorescence um, but mostly you can see where to set the, um, the, the, the box that you're going to count um, discrete from the um, uninfected cells. Um, so um, automating it as a fax method is very convenient. Uh, it takes away a lot of the um, operator skill that's required in some of the other applications um, and of course allows us much higher throughput. So we have some nice potential methods which um, virologists have used for quite a long time and kind of brought up to date to give more sensitivity, which can be applied to some of the, some of the viruses we're making. Um, and actually they work out pretty well. If you take the gold standard, the plaque assay as the gold standard, um, then actually in this case where we've tested the same sample with both the immunostaining, the colorimetric version, um, and then the, uh, the, the fax sorting, um, the number of viruses we get is actually pretty similar. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're only uh, 0.2 logs out in the worst case, which uh, for uh, an assay like this is uh, pretty, it's pretty decent. So, th so they work. Um, the biggest problem we have with um, using this for uh, most of the gene therapy vectors um, is that most of them don't replicate, uh, which is kind of an issue if you're using a, a, an assay which requires replication. Um, so now we can rely on some of our biologics experience because there we're really dealing with proteins and non-replicating gene therapy vectors where they're a lot like proteins really, um, complex um, uh, protein uh, um, structures but uh, proteins nonetheless. Um, so we can use things like HPLC to look at those, same as we would for other proteins. So this is a, 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 just a, a dilution series of uh, uh, purified virus particles on an HPLC um, and so you can make a nice standard curve um, and then when you've got your unknown, of course, you can apply that and work out what the concentration is. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a decent way of doing it. That's quite a nice uh, method. Um, it requires very pure material because otherwise you'll get a lot of other um, uh, signals in there, which is very difficult. So it only really works for final purified material. Um, the biggest disadvantage for this actually is that um, um, in the gene therapy and the viral world, we're used to dealing with these sort of enormous numbers. 10 to the 11, 10 to the 13, 10 to the 15. I mean, absolutely enormous numbers. Um, but actually, in the, in, the, in the world of how much product have you made in milligrams, they're actually really, really tiny. So a typical production process for an AAV, one litre of suspension culture maybe yields about 10 to the 13 particles, which sounds like a lot. 10 to the 13 of anything is a lot. Um, but that's only actually about 100 micrograms of virus. Um, and of the virus, only about two thirds of its protein. So you've only actually made about 65 micrograms of protein from a litre of production. So you're actually sacrificing quite a bit of your product for every HPLC injection you do. Um, so it's a big drawback to using some of the traditional, if we call them that, um, protein biologics um, um, methods, is that the, the the amount of material you need is just orders of magnitude different from the amount of material you typically have available to do um, the analysis for some of the viral products. Um, for some of the work we do with antibodies, um, the, the guys in our formulation um, group would routinely ask for two grams of antibody to do the formulation development. Two grams of virus is probably more than has ever been made in the entire world combined uh, of AAV. You know, it's just an impossible amount to make. Um, so there's, there's just a little bit of um, 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 orders of magnitude are slightly different here. But other methods do work at lower concentrations, also not lost. Um, some of, our, uh, some of our, the work we do in, uh, in proteins does work at lower concentrations, particularly light scatter. Light scatter is a really good method uh, where the sweet spot is maybe 10 to the 8 particles per mil, that kind of amount. Um, so usually even for the viral products we've made, you're diluting them to get them to this point, which is great because you only have a limited amount of them. Uh, and you can see what you get is a nice, uh, a, a nice peak. 
um, showing you the average um, um, size uh, and, and the intensity of that signal is then proportional to the amount that you've got. It's also a neat method because it's a, it's a kind of absolute calculation. It's not, uh, there's no uh, standard that you need to apply. Um, so this is a really useful method. It still requires purified material, which is, uh, which is an issue for us uh, if we want to use anything like this as an in-process test. But it does work out pretty well if you compare those two um, results we got from those two different methods. So the nano site, this is the, the light scatter, the DLS method on the previous slide uh, with the HPLC. Uh, then they, they come out pretty damn close. So um, HPLC works. You just need a lot, of, a lot more material typically than maybe you readily have access to. Um, you need a standard curve, which always falls back to where well, we need to actually work out what that reference standard, what, what are we saying is the true value in that reference standard. As we'll see on a later slide, uh, one of the advantages is, is a way of determining empty versus full as well. So you can do, you get double duty, if you like, from, uh, from the uh, from single analysis. And of course, you can collect the fractions. You've got relatively large amounts of virus, even though it's a small amount of protein in each of those fractions. So you can collect them and do something else with them. Um, but the nanosite is neat because it needs, it doesn't need very much material um, and, it, and it's counting the total particles so you're not making the as assumption that they're um, filled or they're able to transduce cells, you're just counting particles. Okay, so let's. Uh, so if we've got a, an idea about how many how many things we might have made, um, that isn't really what we're interested in because if they don't carry anything, if they haven't got any DNA in them or any uh, nucleic acid in them, they're not really much good to us. So what about empty versus full? Um, well, if you're a virologist, um, the traditional way of making this is um, gradient centrifugation, uh, or either making, doing the separation preparatively, or doing the analysis. Um, so here, if you look on the right-hand side, this is some electron micrographs of what they actually look like, these guys, um, full and empty. So you can, if you look under a microscope, you can physically see that they're different from one another. And actually, there are methods which use TEM to actually look at fields, of, you know, to go through fields, and if you're sufficiently skilled, then you can count how many are filled, how many are empty. Very laborious, very expensive equipment, um, very um, skilled operators required. Um, the alternative is to use some kind of analytical ultracentrifugation. Um, this happens to be disk centrifugation, but uh, a full-blown um, AUC system, of course, could be used as well. And because the, um, because the particles have a different density, whether they're empty spheres, if you like, or filled spheres, you can get a separation. And of course, then um, the, the system then scans um, the separation that's happened and gives you a, a kind of chromatogram, if you like. Um, so, we, and the ratio tells us um, filled versus empty. So, so nice systems exist. This is how um, virologists would, tr would traditionally do these things. Um, as we mentioned earlier on, um, HPLC though is a, is a nice alternative for this. So you can separate the filled versus empty um, for most of these virus particles on HPLC. Um, so here's a, um, here's a separation and you can collect those individual peaks um, and do something else with them. If you want to, for instance, confirm that they are in fact filled or in fact empty, um, then you can take those and, and do that with them. Um, DLS also works. Um, so the light scatter, just as it worked for determining the, um, um, the amount, also can help us with the filled versus empty ratio. So at the top, we have um, a mixture of filled and empty. On the left-hand side, it's individual runs. And on the right-hand side, it's the kind of average at the top, just to give you the, 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 the trend that you see. And you can see there's a main peak and then a, um, a, and then a, a, a secondary peak. And when we look at the purified material, um, you can see that there's a, you get a single peak. So you can, you can use these various methods to, to look at um, um, the different attributes that we're interested in. So multiple orthogonal methods are available, uh, which is really good. Um, some are traditional viral methods, density gradients, um, uh, TEM, um, they have some issues with them around um, operator skill required, um, access to equipment. Um, but some of the traditional protein methods, HPLC, dynamic light scatter, they also have uh, application in these, um, in these viral products. Um, and the great thing about having orthogonal methods available is with something as critical as um, how many particles have you made, um, if they give the same result, give or take, um, then actually we should have a fair amount of confidence that probably is something close to the real result. Um, so just to uh, just to conclude, um, 
effective analytical tools for the uh, for gene therapy products, oncolytic viruses, um, require a kind of combination of these classical virology methods um, and, uh, and methods that have been applied to protein biologics. Um, some of the basic questions, which are very easy to ask, how much have you made? How many of them are filled? What's it filled with? Um, actually very easy questions to ask, but actually rather difficult questions to answer that need um, multiple methods, nested methods or orthogonal methods to give us confidence we're actually really seeing what we think we're seeing. Um, and I guess the thing that we lack at the moment for the gene therapy products, when we're dealing with such small amounts of material, is as we move on beyond those basic questions of how many things have we made, what's it filled with, um, and we begin to look at the microheterogeneity, which has been so important for all the all the protein products we make around oxidized forms, deamidated forms, capsids which have different numbers of different um, um, uh, constituent proteins. Um, those need some really sensitive methods uh, which don't require very much material, much more sensitive than maybe we have available to us currently. So, so I think as we move on from these basic have we made the right stuff to actually looking at um, some of the microheterogeneity, which might well be critical quality attributes we currently don't know much about, well we really need some, um, um, some new more sensitive methods um, to try and tell us about those things. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Andy. Uh, we do have time if there's a question uh, from the crowd. Um, Please, up. Thanks, great talk. Um, I was wondering how these methods might change if you were, let's say, measuring LVV versus AAV versus oncolytic viruses. Are there differences in terms of how you know, HPLC or you know, dynamic light scattering might be used? Yeah, so I, th I think that's one of, one of the challenges with all the gene therapy products is that um, actually it's kind of hard to generalize. So of course some like oncolytic viruses or the adeno, um, doing some kind of uh, replication based assay exists because you can have a permissive cell line, they will lie cells um, or the right cells. Um, whereas things like AAV don't ever really do that, so you don't really have that option available to you. You've also got you know, a broad spectrum of sizes, so the DLS here works great for the adenovirus and things that are a little larger than adenovirus, but really you're pushing your luck with an AAV because really you're down at the, really the limits of uh, what that system can do. So I, I think it's, it's kind of, it, it depends I guess. Hi, uh, as a process development perspective, like how do you monitor the impurities on all these things? Because <laughs> most of the traditional um, literature, everything is available on DNA, host cell protein, or uh, this thing about it. In virus being complex and the envelope is all, you know, proteins are on, everything is going to be a goopy mess in that one. How you're going to monitor this thing on process development? Yeah, so I think um, um, in process testing is interesting for some of these things. Usually, again, because you've made such a small amount of product compared to the amount of similar contaminants that you've also got at that point. Um, for, fortunately, for, mo for lots of the gene therapy vectors, the AAVs, for instance, you know, there's a um, there's an early affinity capture step which gets rid of a lot of the a lot of the rubbish. Um, so actually, you can be a bit more confident that you're tracking what you think you're tracking. But otherwise, it is a challenge to actually make certain that that little tiny peak was the one that you're interested in, and not that great big one next to it. So. And of course, we try to look at ratios of A to 80 versus A to 60 and things like that to try to identify which peaks which, but it's, it's not straightforward. No. 